friends, I want to talk in general about uh, Arabic music and Arabic drumming and the different aspects around it. So I hope you'll bear with me. I'm just going to be just talking and explaining a few aspects that have been standing out, uh, especially lately, where music in general has been kind of up for grab, like anybody can take any music and work with it, which is really great in a way because it frees the music to evolve and always have something new. Um, but within this process, I realized that, uh, and throughout the years, that there are so many things have been altered so, uh, in a way that we're kind of losing touch with the older actual tradition, especially the genuine tradition that created this beautiful music and great drumming and uh, very intelligent uh, systems of, of playing. Uh, to know also about uh, Arabic music in, in general, what we know of Arabic music now, nowadays is a collective evolution of music itself from the 12th century, if you want to go historically. Um, and again, that's important also to know how did things progress? How did this Arabic music that we know come about? How did it uh, evolve? Part of it is understanding that it has a, uh, a root based on older music from the, from the area that it came from, whether if it's from the Arabic Peninsula in Saudi, the Saudi Arabia right now, uh, their origin with their own local chants and uh, playing of drums, different kinds of drums. They have a, a, a great tradition of drumming in all of the peninsula, in Saudi Arabia, in uh, Kuwait, uh, in Bahrain, in Yemen. So all those countries, you know, are part of this bigger uh, semi-island. Um, and from there, when Islam became and uh, it uh, went off with, in the name of Arabic, the Arabic language and uh, their holy book uh, written in that language and it got to be enforced. So even the language itself evolved. It was a certain kind of language with its uh, di uh, certain dimensions of that time from 1400 years ago and before that until when the Prophet Muhammad came and then uh, the whole thing in the name of Arabic. Uh, uh, evolved. So it just took some time until the time of the, uh, the Abbasi uh, Khilafah or period of ruling. They had enough stability to allow uh, things like uh, uh, working on science and scientific things and art, music, uh, clothing, food, things like that. Part of it is working on the music itself. So uh, being the new uh, conquerors who established a, an empire, they wanted to make newer kinds of music and uh, part of it is what we know of the Moshahat right now that it started from that time to build roots for it. That means there were original uh, beats and melodies from Syria for example like if you imagine the, uh, the Syrian area all the way where, they, where, where there was a lot of cultural exchange uh, that meaning when you come down from the peninsula from the Saudi Arabia area you go up to Syria uh, there is more uh, mixing from for thousands of years with the Romans, with the Greeks, with the Persians, uh, different civilizations came there. So there was already established music and also with the establishment of the two big religions, Judaism and uh, Christianity, where they also make, made music and it was uh, influenced by the area. So uh, from there, again, when the Arabs came and the, the Muslims established that, uh, part of the, the music established under the name of Arabic music and uh, language, because all the music that we know right now in this area was written in the Arabic language, and further it was in the classical Arabic language, uh, what we call the Fusha, with whatever variations that they had at that time, and then with the time, the incorporation of the local uh, dialect that uh, also developed. Uh, one thing also to note, like uh, the areas of uh, Syria, all of Syria, most of Iraq and uh, uh, North Africa, they were not Arabs first, they did not speak Arabic. So Arabic uh, language got introduced to them and they got incorporated with their own local languages. And from there, that mixing happened. And uh, so this, again, Arabic music thing with its development, it started taking roots with other local uh, traditions and it built up to be this collective or pan-Arab kind of playing. So when you go all the way down to Yemen, uh, Saudi Arabia, again the other uh, countries on the Gulf, uh, Iraq nowadays, Syria nowadays, uh, Egypt, Tunis, Libya, Morocco and Algeria and all those countries, we speak a common Arabic language and a common Arabic heritage. Part of it is common music heritage, you know. You can see in each one it has its local uh, feel to it, but also there's this Arabic thing was introduced to it, so got mixed in between. So when we say Arabic, it's a bigger word. That's something to understand that, yeah, you have to know exactly from which kind. So all that goes back still to the when in the 12th century when they allowed this uh, evolve, uh, development of the music to come. Uh, part of it was charting and archiving and uh, listing things, translating. 
working on theories, uh, coming up with terms for the, the, the beats and the maqamat and the, the, they created the compass, they were able to draw and write uh, down the names of all those divisions of the maqam, for example, that they discovered. And uh, each one has, again, it's its own name and the branch, what are the branch names. Same thing for the beats, you know, the classical beats of, of, that we know. Samai Thaqil, Awis, Mudawar of all different kinds, Murabba, Muhajjar, Nawakht Hindi, Nawakht Aqsaq, all these beats became during that era. So we don't know exactly when it developed, but again, it developed with a certain inspiration from what came to be collected from the whole area. Again, based on Arabic poetry and language, there was this movement to create music accommodates that more, whether it was a secular music or even religious music. And also religious music contributed to making that music also very important to know, especially in the uh, area in Syria. That's, you know, they had a lot of music, whether Christian or Jewish, that was happening a lot, but mostly Christian and Byzantine melodies and uh, other things. However, the beats themselves that we know, we're not sure exactly how did they evolve, but there's a lot of reference to them being from that area in northern Syria where uh, most of the Moshahat work and the classical work came out and then it inspired the Moshahat in Egypt and after that all the way to, to Morocco. But uh, essentially came out of that area from Halab. Um, okay, so from here, just to know that there is a whole system that got built up, built up uh, with its rules and the Mizan, we always talk about the Mizan area, how to weigh the beat when you play. That's all Arabic uh, ideal for the music, like the music they developed. It requires these tools, these are essential tools. The development of the instruments to fit that music, for example, the Riq, how it developed to become a part of an already existing tambourine, but this size, this uh, you know, shape and all these kind of other dynamics helped to work with this music that we still deal with until now. You know? And this evolution was also uh, through the time, from the 12th century, from that time until now, how many other genres got introduced, what are the different mindsets happened. For example, it was uh, uh, or it started with being Arabic and uh, had the form, and then when the Ottoman Empire came in and took over, it had its own uh, other language that got to be mixed with the Arabic language and Islam and all these kind of different layers to it. And the, the music was part of it. The music also now came to the Ottoman uh, mindset and they w developed from there. So also the Arabs got marked by that. And the, both tradition now they got mixed together. So sometimes you don't know what's Turkish and what's Arabic because of this uh, mix that, that happened. All the way up to the 1800s, and uh, at that time, you know, there were more movements that happened uh, and evolutions in music that was not before that, and now it uh, became tradition, like no more production of that. Uh, something called adwar that uh, developed in Egypt, for example. It's a bit lighter of a classical genre on a 4 4 beat, more, most of the time it's slow, but it depends on uh, voices and the ecstasy of the voice. How can you be elaborate with your voice on the maqam and this slow beat? So e Egypt became famous for it, and then the other Arabs followed suit and they started knowing how to uh, compose adwar. Um, okay, so this is to sum this era, and the point behind this was just to explain that when we're dealing with Arabic music and the Turkish music, and those genres in particular, since I'm that's the music that I do, uh, I always appreciate being being mindful of this idea of yes, there is systematic playing, there is uh, order, there are things, there are, I mean names, and there things can can be archived better. And with the current uh, Arabic situation, uh, if you follow the, the events of life there, you see that there's a lot of saturation and distraction, destruction, uh, things that uh, uh, prevented people from really keeping a collective knowledge and collective understanding so it would be approved by everybody to be shared and transmitted to the next generation. So this is something me and other people who are interested in this working on, being as clear and as precise about this information that we got because it serves uh, showing uh, and making people understand the quality of this music and the power of it, you know. If I want to talk about the beats or the maqam, it's nice to be able to understand how they work and what's the, the origin of these things and the development of it ha until we got it and now we're kind of holding it. We didn't, I didn't think make this music and none of us here. It's been transferred for generations and it's still as genuine as, as, as you can uh, get it to be when you play it by heart and from your heart, I mean, 
and understand it more and get to know the details. You can slow down and question, uh, reason for things, experiment, you can research, you know, especially trying things yourself. When you play that up, you can watch videos, you can watch people playing, but when it comes to you, you play that instrument. What's the feel that's coming out of it? What happens when you're the most precise and what happens when you're not really playing uh, strong enough, you know? Again, just like the, the magic lamp when you rub it and the, the genie comes out of it, really the, the beat and the power of the beat comes out when you play precisely, everything sounds nice on any drum. And that's all the music of the world, this music in general doing that. Uh, we cannot uh, specialize, I mean, it's not exclusive. All music in the world has this beautiful quality to it. The more precise you play the instrument, the more magic comes out of it, in, uh, literally sometimes. So, uh, <clears throat> after all this, I appreciate you listening to these things and I appreciate also your support and help to keep up with these uh, matters and this knowledge, you know. Uh, it's becoming worldwide, we're all trying to share and understand. And it's good to experiment, it's good to uh, try to improvise. Uh, trial and error is something we always uh, can accept, you know, because we need to know, is this true, can this music evolve and go on, or it always makes a fruit that you can uh, maintain as long as possible, and then you can create another fruit, but not to give this fruit completely away or uh, saturated, no. Again, like if you play Mwashah or Dor or Sama'i or any of these uh, compositions, you feel the eternity in it. You can play it anytime, anywhere, after a thousand years or before a thousand years. This music is still a state of the art. I always see this for myself. Uh, anytime you play it correctly with, with this heart and soul, you will feel that this vibration coming out of it at, again at any time. So let's try to keep with this beautiful thing in this life and, uh, and this dimension. All right. Thank you for listening.